so I want you all to imagine that we're going camping. Has anybody been camping? Yes. What do you think about camping? Um, you like camping? Yes. Cool. Is anyone, now, are you willing to admit it, is anyone afraid of the dark? Anyone afraid of the dark? No children here are afraid of the dark. Isn't that amazing? Wow. Come on. Nobody's afraid of the dark? No. You are? See, I, see I'm with you. Like, I've had times where it's dark, and I'm like, man, what's out there? You hear these noises, you're like, it's a bear. It's a, and it's just a squirrel. It's not a bear, right? But if you are out in the dark, it'd be kind of nice to have a... Flashlight. Flashlight. Exactly. A lantern. A lantern. Any kind of light. You take a flashlight, a lantern, a torch with fire on it. Man, it would be great to have light when you're in the dark. What we're going to study this morning is that we live in a world that is filled with darkness. What do you think, now Jesus says that, what do you think darkness refers to in the Bible? It's not a literal darkness. Does anybody know what darkness refers to in the Bible? What do you think? Sin. 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 We live in a world that's filled with sin, and the Bible calls that darkness, man, it would be nice to have a light. A light. Anybody know who is the light for the darkness? Who is it? God. You're close. Jesus. Jesus Christ, who is God in the flesh, but the light for this world is Jesus Christ. And listen, you know, our desire for you kids is that you will come to know Jesus Christ early in life. The earlier, the better. Because otherwise, you'll walk in a world of darkness without the light for this world, all right? We're gonna learn Jesus Christ is the light for this dark world. Great job. You did it, guys. You're all done. And gals, thank you very much. Head on back. Great job. Good job, kids. You know, we do that in our church every Sunday, and of course, one of the reasons is simply to present the message to them that is going to be preached, but another reason is to show parents a very simple example of how you can have devotions with kids. What does that take, five minutes? You know, it wasn't difficult for them. It wasn't a heavy load. And we taught them about Jesus Christ being the light for this dark world. But of course, there's more to learn. So I'd ask you to take your Bibles with me and open them to the Gospel of John and chapter 8. The Gospel of John, chapter 8. And as you open there, I have a question for you. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. I think you probably don't do that here. In my church, I do that all the time. I always say, well, show of hands, raise your hands. You don't have to do that here. But I want to ask you just to think about this. Are any of you dealing with a really difficult situation in life right now? Are any of you going through what might be called a dark time? That's common, right? Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome this world. But we all expect darkness because we do live in a world filled with sin, and this world desperately needs light. Jesus Christ is the light that this world needs. Our text for this morning is going to be John chapter 8 verses 1 through 12, and the title of the message this morning is, Jesus is the light of the world. I'm reading out of a New King James Version. It says, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again into the temple. And all the people came to him, and he sat down, and he taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery, in the very act. Now Moses, in the law, commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger, as though he did not hear. So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and he said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first, or let him throw the first stone. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. 
and Jesus was left alone and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Now before we get into these verses, I want to ask you two quick questions, and I will ask for a show of hands, all right? You ready? Two questions. First, how many of you have in your Bible the verses that I just read to you? Raise your hand. Okay. Every one of you. Every one of you have these verses in your Bible. Second question. How many of you believe that God is almighty? That he is sovereign? That he is all powerful? Good. Everyone should raise their hand. All right. Why do I raise these questions? Well, some of you have notes in your Bible with these verses that say something like, ah, these verses don't belong here, or maybe these verses weren't in the original, or maybe these verses belong somewhere else. But I say to you, these verses are in your Bible, and God is sovereign. And that's why we're going to study them. Some preachers would not preach on these verses that we are about to study. They will have to give an account to Almighty God. I would never pass up these verses, not for anything, because these verses are in Holy Scripture and God is sovereign, all right? Enough said about the text. I want you to notice as we walk through these verses, number one, the darkness, and number two, the light. Very simple outline, the darkness and the light. And then, so that it's a three-point outline, the darkness the light, and you. Notice first the darkness and the simple truth I want you to see, I'm sure I don't need to convince you of this, is that we live in a world that is filled with darkness. And the kids said it correctly. Darkness is a metaphor for sin. Notice verse one. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught him. Do you see the word again in verse 2? It's very important, and it's interesting. Jesus came again into the temple. Well, why did he do that? You know why I ask? We're not going to take time to cover it, but chapter 7 tells us that he's been in the temple teaching for days. This was during one of the great feasts, and Jesus had come to the feast, and he was teaching day after day after day in the temple in Jerusalem. And then many of the people dispersed. Some of the people who had come in from out of town to this feast had left. Jesus went up to the Mount of Olives probably to pray, and the next day after the feast is over, Jesus comes again into the temple to, to teach why? Why would you do that? You've already been teaching. It would be like, it'd be like coming back next Sunday and continuing to preach. Hmm. Here's a, an answer to the question of why Jesus came again into the temple. Because the people needed it. The people needed to know the truth. Jesus Christ came into this world to testify to the truth. John 18, 37 says, he came to testify to the truth about God and about man and sin and salvation and heaven and hell and eternal life. And he came to do that in a world that is filled with error. A world that is filled with lies. A world that is filled with false teaching and false teachers. And when the Bible talks about spiritual darkness, one dimension of the darkness is error. How much error is there in the world today? What do you think? This much? This much error in the world today. These, these, this many false teachers. 
I think it's this much? Or more like, I can't stretch that far. There's so much error in the world today as there was in the first century. So Jesus comes again into the temple because he knows that these people who are in the temple live in a world that is filled with error and lies and false teachers and false teaching and they desperately need that somebody is going to keep on telling them the truth. It's the same today, beloved. We live in a world that is filled with spiritual darkness and one dimension of that darkness is spiritual ignorance and spiritual error. We desperately need the light. Well, here they come. Here they come, the ministers of light, verse three. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. Now stop there. I want you to grasp the scene. I want you to think about this. What is going on here? It's early in the morning. It's in the temple in Jerusalem. Jesus had come in to teach the people. He had sat down. People had gathered around him and he began teaching. When in come the scribes and the Pharisees, the men who were supposed to be ministers of light, agents of truth, preachers of the truth, examples of the truth. And here they come They interrupt the teaching of Jesus Christ. They surround him. They stand this woman in the midst of the circle, this woman caught in adultery in the very act. What do you think this is? You think this is light? Or you think this is darkness? We'll get there. Notice it says the woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Do I need to explain what adultery is? Do I? Who knows what adultery is already? You know what adultery is? We all know. Everyone knows what adultery is. I I hesitate even to give any kind of a description or definition because it's so common in our world today that we know what it is. We know that there are women who say to their man, I will love you till the day I die, and then they walk out and they go off with some other man. And there are men who say to their woman on the day of their wedding, I will love you till the day I die, and then they walk out on their wife and they go and they are with another woman. When the Bible talks about darkness, another dimension of the darkness is sexual immorality. Did you know that adultery used to be considered a crime in America? A crime punishable by the law. But it has become so common in America today that very few states still have it on their books as a crime. And of the very few states that still mark adultery as a crime, none of them enforce it. I read of an occasion back in the 1990s when Michigan, which is one of the few states that still had adultery on the books as a crime, Michigan tried to enforce that law and tried to prosecute someone for committing adultery. It backfired terribly. You know why? Because that sin has become so accepted in our culture that people really don't even view it as a sin anymore. They view it as like, well, yeah, He cheated, but, you know, things were probably bad at home. And adultery is just one form of sexual immorality. Are there any other forms of sexual immorality? Could you imagine if you lived in a society where there were so many forms of sexual immorality that they started assigning letters to them? And like, you know, L lesbianism, a woman with a woman, L, G, a guy with a guy, L, G, B, T, Q, I, A, with a little plus at the end, which means there's more to come. Could you imagine living in a society that is so immoral, that is so in darkness, that they come up with an alphabet soup of letters to represent all the various forms of sexual immorality, and then 
the culture is so dark that people celebrate when young people announce, I'm letter G, or I'm letter L. We live in that culture today, beloved, and we desperately need light. When the Bible talks about darkness, one aspect is ignorance, another aspect is error, and another aspect is immorality. Well, here come the agents of light. Here come the scribes and the Pharisees with a woman caught in adultery in the very act. And they set her in the midst, and all the people are gathered around, and the scribes and Pharisees set up a little circle, and court is in session. Judge Jesus presiding. Verse 4. Take a look. They said to him, teacher, stop there. Do you think that is sincere? How many of you think that the scribes and Pharisees, when they call Jesus teacher, how many of you think that he is being sincere? I'm glad no hands went up. It is not sincere. Chapter 7, verse 1, tells us that the Jews at this time in Christ's life and ministry were seeking to kill him. They are looking for some way that they can put to death the innocent, sinless Son of God. Chapter 7, verse 47 shows that these Jews considered Jesus Christ to be a deceiver. And here, as we will see, all they are doing is seeking an accusation against him. This is not sincere, it's flattery deceitful speech and when the bible talks about darkness one aspect is ignorance another aspect is error another aspect is sexual immorality and another aspect of darkness is insincerity people who will say one thing to your face to flatter you and something totally different behind the back to discredit you to tear you down I'm really thankful that Brother Andre read this morning from Ephesians 4.29. Let no corrupt speech come out of your mouth. Because we live in a society where that's about all that is coming out of the mouths of people around us. Is corrupt speech. Reminds of the psalm, Psalm 12, and in your Bibles it might be Psalm 11, verses 1 and 2. Where the psalmist cries out, help Lord, for the godly man ceases to be. The faithful are disappearing from the sons of men. They are speaking idly, everyone with his neighbor, with flattering lips and a double heart they speak. Those words from the psalmist describe the scribes and Pharisees perfectly. They are coming to Jesus Christ with this woman caught in adultery. They form this little judgment circle around Jesus Christ. They put her in the midst and they say, teacher, And it's so insincere. It's godless. Look at what they say next, verse 4. Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses, in the law, he commanded us that such people should be stoned. And by the way, mark it down. God's view of people who commit adultery are deserving of death. The death penalty. If you are in this room this morning and you commit adultery against your spouse, you deserve the death penalty. You should be on death row. And if anyone is in this church this morning and right now you are engaged in an immoral relationship with someone who is not your husband or your wife, you deserve the death penalty according to God's holy law. Well, the scribes and the Pharisees come in and they say, Moses commanded us that such should be stoned and they say to Jesus, but what do you say? Stop there. What do you think? Is this justice that we're seeing here? How many of you think that what we're seeing here is justice? Oh good, no hands. Because this is the exact opposite of that. This is gross injustice. And it's really just like what we see in the news today. How many of you watch the news? Anybody watch the news? I I really don't want to watch it anymore. There's so much injustice out there. 
lawmakers and lawyers in our land announce charges they brought against certain people all in the name of justice and so often it turns out later that the whole thing was a scam. The whole thing was a sham. All they were doing was trying to bring someone down and discredit him just like the religious leaders here are doing with Jesus Christ. So now let's think about this case, the case of the woman caught in adultery in the very act. First of all, you kind of wonder, how how did they catch her in the act? I mean, how, how did that happen? Don't you think that people who commit adultery would do everything they could to make sure that they would not be caught? Especially if you live in a culture where it's the death penalty for adultery. I smell a rat. I hope you know that expression. Something's up. Something is not right here. You wonder how she was caught in the very act. I personally, I think she was set up. I think it's possible, and I don't know this for sure, but I think it's possible that this woman who was caught in adultery was the wife of one of the scribes and Pharisees. I don't know that. But I wonder if maybe she's not the wife of one of the scribes and Pharisees. And the scribes and Pharisees are wanting to put Jesus to death. And they're like, you know what let's do? Let's catch my wife in adultery because I know what she's doing. I know where she is. Let's catch her and let's bring her to Jesus Christ and let's see what he does. And we'll kill two birds with one stone. Second question I have about this. Did Moses command in the law that such people should be stoned? You just shake your head. Did Moses command in the law that people who commit adultery should be stoned, yes or no? Yes, thank you. I like to make sure you're tracking. If you're with me, say amen. Let's say a couple of you. All right. Yes, Moses did command in the law that such people should be stoned, but here is what he said. Deuteronomy 22, 22. If a man is found lying with a woman, married to a husband, then... Both of them shall die. Where's the man? Where's the man? If you scribes and Pharisees have this woman caught in adultery in the very act, where's the guy? Did he like escape out the window? Did he run off quicker than you could snag him? I doubt it. I think it's a setup. Third, Did you notice how they worded this? Look at the text again. Look at chapter 8, John 8. Take a close look in verse 4. They said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery. They did not say, We caught this woman in adultery. Anybody know Russian language? We, does anyone know Russian language? Yeah, okay. It's okay. Passivni zalok. Stradatni, da? So it's the passive. Which raises the question, who's the actor? Who caught her? We don't know. You know what that raises? Where are the witnesses? Where are the witnesses to this crime? Stay tuned. Hang on. Keep listening. Because as you'll find out, not one of the witnesses is here. When the Bible talks about darkness, it is talking about ignorance. That's why Jesus went again into the temple. It's talking about error. That's why Jesus went again into the temple. It's talking about immorality, which is adultery, and probably this woman was caught committing adultery. I don't doubt that. It's talking about insincerity and injustice, and today, beloved, you live in a world that is filled with all of those things. You live in a world that is desperately in need of some light. Notice verse 6, because it gets darker. This they said, testing him. You know what the word is? The same word used of the devil testing Jesus in Matthew 4. This they said, tempting him. They want him to make an error. They want him to make a mistake. They want him to fall into sin of some kind. They said this, tempting him, in order that they might have something of which to accuse him. Now that's really dark. These religious leaders, the lights for the people, they come into the holy temple of God. They interrupt the Son of God in his teaching. They bring in this woman caught in adultery, and she probably was. She never denies it. 
But they do all of this not for the sake of justice, but for the sake of the grossest injustice that has ever been perpetrated in the history of mankind. They do all of this so that they might catch Jesus in something so that they can accuse him, so that they can kill him. Beloved, that is the kind of world that we live in. This is what's called a classic catch-22. You might not know that phrase, catch-22, which means if Jesus agrees with the law of Moses and he says, stone her, he's caught. Because where's the mercy? Where's the mercy? Where's the compassion? If, on the other hand, Jesus Christ lets her go, then they will have something for which to accuse him. Where's the justice? Where's the upholding of the law of Moses? This whole charade is a sin-sick setup orchestrated by evil men masquerading as ministers of truth. Good thing we've progressed since then as a society, right? Yeah, we have not progressed. People do the exact same thing today. They set traps. They stir up dirt. They destroy reputations. They use other people as pawns. They abuse power just to get more power. And all the time, many of them go to church. It's very possible that in this room today is someone masquerading as a Christian. When the Bible talks about spiritual darkness, you know what it's talking about? Ignorance error, insincerity, immorality, injustice, and hypocrisy. Putting on a veneer of godliness, all the while living in ungodliness. How do you deal with that? I mean, how can you live in a world like that? How can we possibly live in a world like this and have joy? How can we possibly live in a world like this and have discernment? How can pastors deal with people who bring these things to them and try to trap them? How can people who serve the Lord deal with situations where there's, it's so dark, there's so much evil, there's so much sinning that you don't even know where to start? How can you possibly live and work and play and raise children and deal with circumstances and deal with your boss and deal with your coworkers and deal with your employees in a world that is so filled with darkness? You know how? with a light. That's how. If only you had a light, then you'd be fine. You could have wisdom and knowledge and understanding and discernment and truth and even power to overcome darkness if only you had a light. So second point. Praise God we've gotten to the second point. Let's talk about the light of the world. Let's talk about Jesus Christ, verse six. Watch how the light handles the darkness. This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus, there it is. There's the transition, there's the contrast. But Jesus, praise God for Jesus Christ. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. Here's the million dollar question. You ready? What did Jesus write on the ground? Answer, we have no idea. (laughs) Nobody knows. But here's what we do know. This is not the first time that Jesus has dealt with darkness. This is not the first time that Jesus Christ has been tempted or tested. And when he was tempted by the devil, what was his spiritual weapon of choice? The word of God. I wonder if he wrote the word of God. Second, we also know that Jesus wrote on the ground. The term here and the term in verse eight tells us he was not drawing a picture. Don't believe anyone who tells you that he's drawing. I had a guy tell me one time he was gonna do a message on art in worship from John eight. I said, art? Artwork? Where are you getting artwork? Well, Jesus drew a picture on the ground. No, he didn't draw a picture. He wrote on the ground. Napisana is the same word from which we get scripture. Third, 
we know that Jesus Christ is a teacher of what? Of scripture. So I think a good guess is that Jesus Christ wrote on the ground some scripture. The better question to ask though is why? Why would Jesus Christ stoop down and write on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear? That also is not answered, but I have some wisdom for you, and I think it is the answer. Proverbs 15, 28 says, the righteous ponder how to answer. That's light right there. The righteous, that is righteous people, people who are truly interested in pleasing God, when they face a really difficult situation, they take time to ponder how they are going to respond. I think Jesus is doing that. Well, they continued, verse seven, they continued pressing him for an answer that's more darkness, impatience, insistence. And when Jesus was good and ready to respond, he raised himself up and he said to them, he who is without sin among you, let him cast the first stone. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. What do you think about that answer? What do you think about that? You know, at first glance, you might think, that sounds pretty simple. It's not. The answer of Jesus Christ here is brilliant. I mean, it's just unbelievably brilliant. First of all, with that simple response, by Jesus saying, let, who, let him who is without sin among you cast the first stone, Jesus Christ is calling for the witnesses to step out from among the scribes and Pharisees. That's what he's saying. Where are the witnesses? Whoever witnessed this and whoever has no sin in this matter, Jesus is not saying let him who is without sin in the entire life. That's not what he means. Let the sinless person step out. That's not what he's saying. He's saying let him who is without sin in this matter of this woman caught in adultery, let him step out as a witness to the act and let that person cast the first stone. Does Jesus uphold the law of Moses? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Deuteronomy 17, 8. The hands of the witnesses shall be the first ones to put to death. And so by this simple but brilliant answer, Jesus Christ is upholding the law of Moses. Check. Second, notice how Jesus worded his answer. He worded his answer in such a way that makes the scribes and the Pharisees judges of each other. I mean, it's, it makes me want to cry. It's so brilliant. It is so brilliant. Look. Let him who is without sin among you, which now puts the burden on them and makes it so that all the scribes and Pharisees have to look at each other and be like, are you without sin in the matter? No, you're not without sin in this matter. Are you without sin in the matter? No, no, you're with us. You, you've sinned with us. Are you without sin in the matter? And as they look around, they all realize, oh my gosh, none of us is without sin in this matter. We have all joined forces together to try and find an accusation against Jesus, and he's just caught us with one word, with a simple answer. Praise God for the light of the world. The one who can expose evil with a word. Third. Notice what happens. They start going out one by one. It says, verse nine, then those who heard this being convicted by their conscience or in their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. What just happened here? Listen, I'm gonna tell you what happened. Pay attention. The religious leaders of Israel were just caught in adultery in the very act. All throughout the Old Testament, God speaks of spiritual unfaithfulness as adultery. All the scribes and Pharisees involved in this deal are guilty of spiritual adultery. 
They are serving not God. They are serving themselves. They're serving idols. They're guilty of idolatry. And Jesus caught them with one word. They were trying to make it look like they love God. They were trying to make it look like they uphold the law of Moses. When in fact, they were hating God and despising the one who is greater than Moses. They were just caught in the very act of spiritual adultery. And by way of application, brethren, beware. Beware the leaven of the Pharisees, which is what? Hypocrisy. How many religious leaders in churches have fallen into the sin of hypocrisy? where there is this show of loving and serving God, but in reality, they are just loving themselves. Sooner or later, that will be exposed by Jesus Christ. And you never want to be in the position that these spiritual leaders are in. You see where it says they were convicted? What does that mean? They were exposed, laid naked. Their sin is now brought to light, all by the simple words of Jesus Christ. And being convicted in their conscience, they started going out, not out of the temple completely, just out of this little circle, one by one, starting with the oldest. Why? Who had the most knowledge in this group? Who had the most experience in this group? Who more than anyone else should have known better in this group? Who in this group is most guilty before God of sinning against knowledge, wisdom, and experience? The oldest. They, most of all, should have known better. And by way of application, again I say to you, beloved, beware. I would suggest that in any group of people who gather together to commit sin, the most guilty among them is the eldest. And that in any group of elders in a church, the eldest of the elders need to be most careful that they do not go along with anything that is questionable. They bear the most guilt if they allow leadership to go astray. One by one, these leaders left the circle, and Jesus is left alone with the woman standing in the midst. So listen, get the scene now. They're still in the temple. The religious leaders are still here. The crowd is still there. Christ is still there. This woman is still there. But now there's no judgment circle around her. Now, this woman stands alone before her maker, Jesus Christ, with all the people watching on. Watch what Jesus does. When Jesus had raised himself up and he saw no one but the woman. Now, there's no one in that circle but this woman alone. He said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. This is amazing. Moments ago, this woman was surrounded by a group of accusers. And she literally was facing possible death. Jesus could have said, yep, stone her and she would have died. A moment ago, she was on death row, about to be executed. And now, Jesus says, where are those accusers of you? Has no one condemned you? And she says, no one, Lord. I'm telling you, the situation, her situation, could not have been darker a moment ago, and now the light is starting to shine. And it's all changed thanks to Jesus Christ. Not one accuser remained, but she's not out of the woods yet. What will Jesus say? And Jesus said to her, look, verse 11. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. What did Jesus just do? What did he just do? Here's what he, be careful, here's what he just did. He did not condemn her. That's what he did. He did not condemn her. Why? Isn't adultery a sin? Yes. Isn't adultery a sin deserving of death? Yes. 
Won't adulterers and adulteresses in the end be condemned? Yes. Won't adulterers and adulteresses in the end be condemned by Jesus Christ? Yes. Then why did he not condemn her? Here's why. John 3, 17. Because God did not send his son into this world to condemn this world. Not the first time. Right? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into this world to condemn this world, but that the world might be saved through him. And so listen, listen closely. And so to the end, that this woman caught in adultery might be saved, Jesus, number one, does not condemn her. Number two, he puts her back under the law puts her back into the law by saying, go and sin no more. You think she can do that? If Jesus told you today, when you leave these, this, these four walls, when you leave this church today, I want you to go and sin never again. How many of you can do that? Nobody. Nobody. So Jesus didn't condemn her. He put her back under the law, and now she needs one more thing to be saved. You know what it is? The gospel. That's what she needs. The gospel is the power of God into salvation. The only thing she needs now is the gospel by which God saves sinners. Where is it? Verse 12. So God, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, gives her now the gospel. Then Jesus spoke to them, them all, the scribes, the Pharisees, the crowd, and the woman caught in adultery. He says to them all, I am the light of this world he who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of, light of life. Beloved, that is the gospel of Jesus Christ in a nutshell. You see the word darkness? Verse 12. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness. Darkness is what our world is filled with. This world is filled with error and ignorance and insincerity, sexual immorality, injustice, hypocrisy, and unbelief. But Jesus Christ is the light for this dark world. Meaning what? Meaning that Jesus Christ is everything you need and he is all that you need in order to overcome the darkness of this world. He's the truth that you need to discern error. He is the knowledge that you need to be no longer ignorant of the truth. He is the wisdom that you need to deal with every difficult situation and to make wise decisions. Jesus is even the comfort you need to deal with hard times. And he is the righteousness that you need to be right in the sight of holy God. I read somewhere that John Wesley's favorite verse to preach was 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30. It says this, but of him, of God, that is of God's work, you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. And here is John Wesley's summary of that one verse. John Wesley writes, of him, that is out of his free grace and mercy, of him are ye in, that is engrafted into Christ Jesus, who is made unto us, that is, he is made unto us that believe wisdom when before we were foolish and ignorant, and righteousness, that is, he is the sound, the sole ground of our justification, whereas before we were under the wrath and curse of God. And he is sanctification, universal holiness, whereas before we were altogether dead in our sin, and he has become to us redemption, that is complete deliverance from all evil and eternal bliss both of soul and body. Amen. Jesus Christ is everything you need for this life. He's everything you need to walk wisely and to walk joyfully in a world that is filled with darkness. And Jesus says, look at this great promise, verse 12. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, 
but have the light of life. This, this is what that means. He who listens to what Jesus Christ says and believes that rather than what the world says, and he who listens to what Jesus Christ commands and does that rather than what the world says, he who listens to what Jesus Christ promises and hopes in that rather than what the world says, he who follows Jesus Christ by faith will not walk in darkness, that is a promise, but will have the light of life. You know what that means? You will lack for nothing. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I shall not lack. If Jesus Christ is your shepherd, if Jesus Christ is your flashlight, you will not lack for anything ever. That's the good news, beloved. And so I ask you, what about you? We looked at the darkness, we've looked at the light. What about you? Have you turned from darkness to light? Have you turned away from following yourself and from following sin to follow the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you now have the light of this world? What's the application of this? Well, first, if you do have the light of this world, praise God for Jesus Christ. Praise God for Jesus Christ. Praise God who by his grace and by his Holy Spirit, through the gospel, has opened our eyes and turned us out of darkness to walk in light. He's turned us from the power of Satan to the power of God so that we might receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in Jesus. Acts 26, 18. Praise God for Jesus Christ, the light of this world. Second, proclaim his excellence. Listen, that is your calling. You are a chosen generation, says 1 Peter 2.9. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own special people. For what purpose? To what end? So that you might proclaim the praises of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. And third, just put these two words into practice in every area of life. What are the two words? Follow me. Jesus says, follow me. Put that into practice in your marriage. Put that into practice in your family. Put that into practice in your ministry. Put that into practice at work. Learn what it means to follow the light of this world in every aspect of your life, and you will never walk in darkness. You will have the light of life. It is possible, beloved, completely possible, to live in this world that is filled with sin and error and ignorance and false teachers and injustice and hypocrisy, it is possible to live in this world with great joy and with great hope, with great wisdom and with great knowledge. How? Follow Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Stand together with me and let's pray. Father God, we praise you and thank you for your son Jesus Christ, the light of this world. We certainly understand the darkness. We all have been part of that darkness and we're part of that darkness for far too long. Some of us came to Christ early in life and some came to Jesus Christ later in life. We all know about the darkness. But thank you, Father, for sending Jesus Christ to be the light for this world and to show us the way. Father, help us to follow him. And if there's anyone in this room this morning, Father, who does not have Jesus Christ, who is not saved, Please, Father, be merciful. May today be the day of salvation for that lost soul. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.